Hi, I'm Mary Margaret McAllen with the Witte Museum. I'm the director of special projects. Pleased to bring you um, the conference on Texas. This is our third annual. The theme this year is resilience, past, present, and future, which has taken on a more uh, deep meaning in these uh, curious COVID-19 times. I'm pleased today to introduce to you Jean, uh, speakers Jean Fowler and Magali Chocano. They're going to be speaking on uh, border radio um, in the 1920s and 30s and to social media today. So we'll begin with Jean. Jean Fowler is a writer, performer, and independent researcher based in Texas. He's written for the Journal of Texas M Music History, Oxford American, San Francisco Chronicle, True West, Gl and Glass Tire, and other publications. His theatrical appearances have included the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the San Antonio Rodeo, Contemporary Arts Museum of Houston, the White Elephant Saloon in Fort Worth, the Old Jail <clears throat> Art Center in Albany, the Bullock State History Museum, and the Briscoe Museum of Western Art. He has presented talks at the Texas State Historical Association, the Texas Folklore Society, Glen Rose Community Center, Mineral Wells Public Library, Institute of Texan Cultures and many other venues. He's not to be confused, he urges, with the famous writer Gene Fowler or the California poet Gene Fowler, <clears throat> who experimented with stand-up com comedy and uh, armed robbery for which he did time. <laughs> um, so Gene Fowler was born in 1950 and grew up in Dallas in a showbiz family. His books include Border Radio, Crazy Water, and Mavericks. He's currently working on a photo history of North Texas music for TCU Press. Welcome, Gene. Epic poem about the high, lonesome, lovesick rise and fall of a country western singer. That night, Clem yodeled from his toes up had to tote him from the mic. Clem and the Cowboy Kings tore up their tunes as phantoms of a poet's muse, but their flesh, blood, and whiskey kin conjured their sound into every corner of North America and beyond. Clem's audience would have known that the radio at Del Rio meant one of the high-powered radio stations along the northern frontier of the Republic of Mexico that blasted their signals northward in English from 1930 to 1986. Over the course of those 56 years, border radio exerted a peculiar mesmerizing influence on American music, politics, religion, advertising, healthcare, and sexuality. Border radio was an underground cultural phenomenon that blasted down Main Street and from border to border and beyond. Wild and unregulated, the world wide web of its day, border radio smoked through the ether like a global blast of juke joint mojo. Now these stations were called outlaw broadcasting stations because especially in the early days, they were started by maverick broadcasters who had been kicked off the airwaves by the federal government. Uh, next slide, please. Like the man we call the badass grandpa of border radio, Dr. John R. Brinkley. Are you pooped out, flat as a tire? Is your woman nosing around in another mule stall? Well, if so, you could have used the services of Dr. Brinkley, a graduate of the Eclectic Medical University, a man who modestly described himself as the most learned doctor in America. Now, Dr. Brinkley became world famous in the Roaring Twenties for pioneering an early agricultural version of Viagra. Simply put, Dr. Brinkley inserted thin slivers of goat gonads into the personal equipment of a male human. The goat gland proposition Dr. Brinkley advertised would make a man the ram what am with every lamb. All energy is sex energy, he testified over his own radio station, KFKB. Now, obviously, this was just way too much fun for the law to allow. And in 1931, 
Doc Brinkley lost both his radio license and his license to practice medicine. Branded an outlaw, he lit out for the broadcasting badlands along the Silvery Rio Grande. But before he did, he ran for governor of Kansas, and people say he would have won if all the write-in votes had been counted. His slogan, let's pasture the goats on the state house lawn. Next image, please. Doc set up in the Chihuahuan Desert Oasis of Del Rio, where 60 million gallons of spring water flowed from San Felipe Springs every day and ran through the acequias in the old quarter of town. Across the Rio Grande in Villa Acuna, Doc uh, rose the towers of Doc's border blaster, XER, later called XERA. Licensed by the Mexican government at 500,000 watts, directional antennas shot the signal northward at a colossal 1 million watts. It's said that folks could pick up XER and XERA on bed springs, on barbed wire, or even on their dental work. And I like to think about, um, you know, some couple out on a date and the guy opens his mouth and suddenly uh, what comes out of his mouth is Dr. Brinkley talking about human anatomy and other things. But other outlaws soon followed. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this guy here, Norman Baker, a former vaudeville mentalist who always dressed in purple and claimed to have a cure for cancer, got run out of Muscatine, Iowa for his own incendiary broadcast over his own radio station, KTNT, which stood for naked, Know the Naked Truth. You can see here, uh, Norman Baker eventually got sent to prison for mail fraud, so that's his mugshot there. But Baker established radio station XENT in Nuevo Laredo, and the purple literature for his cancer clinic uh, told patients to phone 666 upon arrival in Laredo, Texas. His massive radio transmitter was so heavy that it broke the bridge when they were hauling across the border. And while Norman Baker ran for governor of Iowa from his radio outpost on the Rio Grande, Texas Governor Ma Ferguson dispatched Texas Rangers to arrest him on an Iowa charge of practicing medicine without a license. But Breaker could not be lured north of the border. In time, powerful radio stations dotted La Frontera from Tijuana to Tampico. XCR, next slide please, XCR, was advertised as the sunshine station between the nations. In Piedras Negras and Eagle Pass, XEPN became the voice of the Western Hemisphere. Nuevo Laredo's XENT boasted that it covers the Americas like a blanket. Reynosa's XED, later renamed XEAW, was dubbed the voice of two republics. And XEG down in Monterey, Nuevo Leon, was the voice of North America. Now, the Mexican government allowed these maverick broadcasters to set up on Mexican soil because the United States and Canada had divided up all the long-range radio wavelengths between themselves, allotting none to Mexico. And because the station's high wattage could interfere with the signals of smaller American stations and even knock them off the air, the border stations became an effective bargaining chip for Mexico. Magazines like the Saturday Evening Post ran headlines such as The Border Radio Mess and Mexico Menaces American Radio. But even a lower powered border station could turn outlaw. Next slide, please. Reynosa's XCD, which began broadcasting in 1930 at 100,000 watts, was bought was at 10,000 watts, rather, excuse me, was bought by Houston movie theater and radio station owner Will Horowitz in 1931. Now, Horowitz was a colorful philanthropist. He had uh, big Christmas parties every year for underprivileged children in Houston, and he had, he had movie theaters where he kept his ticket prices low, and when the studios pressed him to raise his ticket prices, he installed live hogs in the lobbies of the theater with signs on them that read, movie hog trust. And the photo here is from uh, the 1928 National Democratic Convention in Houston. Uh, and on that occasion, Horowitz gathered 50 donkeys and presented them to the convention uh, 
I think one of them went to Alfred Smith, who was uh, the nominee that year. But uh, that was an occasion, I would think, where people visiting Texas felt that the state lived up to its name when they received the 50 donkeys. But uh, uh, his friend Jimmy Rogers uh, uh, went down to, to Reynosa to appear, to appear on the relaunch of XED when Horowitz took it over. But then uh, he started rebroadcasting the state of Tamaulipas lottery back into the states. And he was actually arrested and convicted of using the U.S. mails to conduct a lottery and sent to Leavenworth. But six months later, when FDR uh, pardoned him, 2,000 Houstonites greeted him at, and when he returned to the train station in Houston. Next slide, please. Have you ever thought about how absolutely necessary water is to keep you alive? Why, a man may live for 40, 60, or even 80 days without food, but deprive him of water for five or six days and he'll die a horrible death. Your body itself is about four-fifths water. Don't drink a large quantity in a few gulps. Sip it, but sip lots of it. And that's the way to drink crazy water. Yes, good. Crazy water. Now, if you'll add about a teaspoonful of crazy water crystals to about a large glass of water, preferably warm, and drink it 30 minutes before breakfast for the next three weeks, I'm just confident that it will help you overcome any condition that was caused or being made worse by a sluggish system. Crazy water, discovered in mineral wells in Texas in the 1880s, got its name when a supposedly insane woman drank from a particular well over a period of time and reportedly became sane. And uh, it's noted that the, some of the water in mineral wells has lithium in it, so there may be some truth to the folklore in that case. But uh, in the 1920s, conservative Dallas insurance magnate Car P. Collins bought the crazy water business and built the crazy water hotel, which you see here. And before long, the company was sponsoring hillbilly, cowboy, and big band music broadcasts from Texas all the way up to Canada. Uh, Hank Snow up in Canada, his first professional job was for a program sponsored by Crazy Water Crystals. And in the late 1930s, the decidedly unflamboyant Mr. Collins purchased the border blaster XCAW in Reynosa to boost his advertising power. But he did, however, have a rather colorful business partner in the station. Next slide, please. We will now present the official gubernatorial flower sack of the great state of Texas. Hillbilly flower on the air. Hillbilly music everywhere. It tickles your feet. It tickles your tongue. Wherever you go, its praises are sung. Please pass the biscuits, Pappy. Next slide, please. Pappy, of course, was Fort Worth flower salesman W. Lee O'Daniel. Pappy became a Texas radio star in the 1930s, first as the announcer for the Light Crust Doughboys and Light Crust Flower, and then for his own Hillbilly Boys and promoting his own brand of Hillbilly Flower. The businessman and corn pone media personality was inexplicably elected governor of Texas in 1938 and U.S. Senator from Texas in 1941. In the, in the latter election, he handed Lyndon Johnson the only electoral defeat of LBJ's political career. As governor and senator, however, O'Daniel was erratic, unpredictable, and woefully ill-equipped to govern. When the mainstream media of the day began demanding copies of his speeches in advance, Pappy simply addressed his constituents over the powerful radio station on foreign soil that he co-owned with the promoter of Crazy Water Crystals. As one voter said, I've been listening to W.O. Daniel on the radio for years, and he's a good man. It ain't his fault he didn't do nothing. Now, along with the western swing provided by Pappy's Hillbilly Boys, the tremendous range of the station helped popularize the singing cowboys. Uh, it's, it's, you know, cowboy music is so prevalent in 
most of our lives as, as we were growing up. I mean, uh, Gene Autry on TV and Roy Rogers, it just seemed like it was part of our DNA. But uh, when the border station started in the 30s, John Lomax's book on cowboy songs, it only, it only came out 20 years earlier. So uh, there was still a lot of work to do to make cowboy songs part of the American DNA. And the songbooks helped quite a bit. Uh, I have I have here, I've collected up several songbooks from the 1930s that were published by the border stations. And they would play up the Mexican angle, uh, like uh, this one here, you can see is the old cow hand on the Rio Grande. Uh, let, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this this songbook was, was one that was put out by Cowboy Slim Reinhardt. And then uh, we also had a guy on Border Radio called the Utah Cowboy, and he called himself the Utah Cowboy. He was from Fort Worth originally, and he called himself the Utah Cowboy, even though he had never been to Utah. So that's his songbook, and you can see here how they mailed him out. It just said U Utah Cowboy, XEPN, Eagle Pass, Texas. Um, <clears throat> But Cowboy Slim Reinhardt became the best known uh, border singer, cowboy singer on the border. And I always liked the story of when he auditioned for XEPN in Piedras Negras and Eagle Pass. <clears throat> the station manager thought that Reinhardt was the worst singer he'd ever heard. But then when, when uh, Major Cord heard, a, uh, heard the audition, <clears throat> Major Cord was a pitch man who spelled his last name K-O-R-D. He, he sold piano lessons over the radio. And other things, but when he heard when he heard uh, Slim's audition, he said, "That is a, how that is how, the great that is the greatest cowboy singer I've ever heard in my life. That is how, how a cowboy would actually sound. I'll put that boy on the air, and I'll stake a week's wages that he will pull more mail on this station than everybody else put together." Next slide, please. Now another popular cowboy singer on the border was this guy, Jesse Rogers. Uh, he was Jimmy Rogers' first cousin. And um, he went down to the border in the, in the mid 1930s. And as you can see here, he really played up the, the angle of old Mexico uh, advertising his songbook. He called himself radio's number one cowboy songster. And uh, his, his songbook came with a souvenir of old Mexico album get the famous collection of beautiful ballads and old time Western songs in the souvenir old Mexico album. Next slide, please. Hillbilly bands like the Pickard family and the Carter family were also hugely popular on border radio. The Carters moved to Del Rio in the late thirties where they made a great deal more money and, and had a much, uh, much bigger audience than they would have had on stations back home in Virginia, where banjo master Dr. Ralph Stanley tuned them in on his family Philco. You could hear them beaming all the way from Mexico, he marveled, like someone talking to you across the table. Now it's said that Johnny Cash, while growing up in Arkansas, first heard his future wife, June Carter Cash, on Dr. Brinkley's XCRA when she sang as a child with her, with the Carter family. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and a not yet famous Woody Guthrie performed on border station XCLO in the late 1930s when it was located in Tijuana. Now, I interviewed the ladies uh, seen here. Uh, she went by the stage name of Lefty Lou, and she sang with Woody on the program. And she told me that their gig on XCLO was fairly short-lived because the Mexican government arrested the group when Woody uh, said over the air that the musicians had smuggled some songs into Canada, meaning that the station uh, was heard in Canada. <clears throat> but the government could not get past the smuggled aspect of it. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And the border stations also did quite a bit to uh, introduce Americans to Mexican music. And not long after the first book first appeared in late 1987, I received a letter from a man who had grown up in South Dakota and, uh, in the 1930s. And he said that while he enjoyed the cowboy singers, the real highlight of the program for him was the song Estralita as performed by Rosa Dominguez, the Mexican Nightingale. 
to this South Dakota farm boy, he wrote, that sounded like the angels in heaven. And among the uh, many other Mexican and Mexican-American artists played on the stations was Lydia Mendoza, uh, shown here. A biography of, of Lydia relates that the first time she played the Mexican interior city of Chihuahua, residents were so familiar with her from hearing her recordings on border stations that they greeted her, they lined the streets to greet her as she drove into town. Uh, before that, I'd always assumed that the stations <clears throat> with their uh, northward thrust were only really heard, you know, that they weren't heard in the interior of Mexico, but apparently they were. So that's, that's really interesting. Uh, next slide, please. In the 60s, wild and strange radio personalities like Dr. Jasmo, Howlin' Rooster, and Wolfman Jack introduced a generation of American kids to artists like Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, and Lightning Hopkins. Listeners would, could not tell if Wolfman was black or white, man or woman, human being or UFO. Um, now, when I first started researching this subject in the 1980s, <clears throat> I, was, <clears throat> I was surprised to learn that half a century earlier, it was actually illegal for preachers to solicit money on the air. And just as odd, psychics and fortune tellers were not allowed on American airwaves at the time. Border Radio provided an outlet for both activities. Next slide, please. One of our favorite psychics was a lady named Rose Dawn. She and her husband, who went by the stage name of Koran, <clears throat> founded the Mayan Order in Del Rio in the 1930s. Later, they moved the operation to San Antonio. And there used to be a big red electric sign at 731 Fredericksburg Road that said Mayan Order. And they also founded the Mayan Dude Ranch in Bandera, Texas. Now I'm going to play about two minutes of a rare recording of Rose Dawn from down on the border. This uh, image on the screen here is <clears throat> her, her magazine that she put out in Del Rio. It was a national astrology magazine that was published from Del Rio in the 1930s. <clears throat> and uh, Time magazine described Rose Dawn as a blonde, blondined uplifter. I'm not sure what that was, but that's what Time magazine called her. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Now, our border radio mentor, the late pitchman, singing cowboy, and metaphysician Dallas Turner, said that some of the preachers on border radio were sanctified and some of them were cranktified. And some smarty pants surrealist in Austin bought time on border stations and aired their 
satire of uh, the Cranktified Preachers. And they had a program called the Brother Human Hour. And uh, they asked for money, as the preachers would do all through the program, but listeners failed to send them a single dollar, which I think proves that you just cannot satirize the real deal. I mean, these guys were so creative and so unusual that when these um, surrealist artists trying to try to satirize them, it just didn't work. And I've, I've been told, though, that my uh, my own preacher impressions can scare little children and people my own age. And so I'll try to be subdued here with just a little taste of the actual messages from the border preachers. Uh, and Andrew, we'll, we'll have to segue to uh, Magali in a few minutes, so go ahead. And yeah, I'll go ahead and close here uh, with, with this. Uh, it's, it's pretty short. Do not use the zip code. Zip codes are a communist plot designed to confuse the nation. Do not use the Pope Gregory calendar. Jesus was born in October, not December. I shall smack ye with insanity. I shall smack ye in your knees. I shall smack ye in your elbows. I shall smack ye in your head. I shall smack ye in your kidney. For the earth is fixing to be cursed with a curse. I'm fixing to make the rich be eaten. I'm fixing to eat the rich. There's fixing to be a frog epidemic in Florida like in the time of Moses. Two toads can produce 25,000 frogs a year, so there can be millions in a square mile. Right now, there's a plague has hit this nation. Minnesota is being eaten up in caterpillars. Canada is five inches deep in caterpillars. In Georgia, hail is eight inches thick. Automobiles have been beat to a total loss. Moan, my people, moan. Moan until your voices are hoarse. Moan until you hurt in your chest. Let me hear the cry, the cry for renewal, or I'll rip you apart. Jandu Nindanu Dvainu. Thank you, Jean. Coast to coast and border to border, wherever you are, wherever you may be. Thank you very much. Now I'm pleased to um, introduce Magali Tricano. She is um, CEO of SWEB Development. It's, she's a native of Madrid, Spain, and she founded SWEB Development in 2008 as a web mobile app development and social media marketing firm. Today, SWEB is a full service digital agency servicing Fortune 500 companies and nonprofits alike. In August of 2009, she launched SWEB Apps the first build-your-own phone application platform for small businesses online. Today, SWEB Development is an award-winning digital agency that services development needs worldwide from Fortune 500 companies to nonprofits. Magali spent many years as an agency broadcast producer in the U.S. Hispanic and Latin American markets, developing TV, radio, and print campaigns for clients such as Coors Light, Reynolds Wrap, Burger King, and General Mills. SWEB clients benefit from Magali's creative vision and strategy, digital marketing focus, and understanding of value results. Magali and her team have been at the forefront of development strategy in the digital space of half of large national and international brands. SWEB has been featured in Time Magazine, USA Today, ABC News, Fox Business News, Business Week, Wall Street Journal, Mashable, and Giga Ohm among many others. Magali recently served as a mentor to two teams in Techstars, a business startup incubator, and was voted one of the best mentors this year. Magali also serves on the board for TechBlock, Entrepreneur Organization, Venture Lab, and Youth Orchestra San Antonio. Magali was recognized by San Antonio Business Journal as one of the 40 most influential people under 40, in 2013, Magali was recognized as one of, of 10 fun and fearless Latinas by Cosmo Magazine, awarded the South by Southwest Social Revolution Innovator Award, and recognized as the Small Business of the Year by Hispanic Chamber. Um, we welcome Magali, who's going to be speaking on social media today and the future. Welcome, Magali. 
Thank you, Mary Margaret. Um, it was so interesting to hear uh, uh, Jean talk about um, the the past and sort of I was relating it to everything I was going to speak about uh, on social media. And it, you know, one of the ways that he described it was the wild, wild west, which is really sort of what it's become. Uh, social media, what it's become for um, civic engagement. And um, what's been really interesting is that social media in this time has really provided uh, a perfect set of ingredients to produce social capital and establish trust to move masses, which I think is something that we haven't had in a long time. Um, we that social media has propelled civic engagement massively, and it's created really sustained political movements in which more than half of Americans in a study that I was reading uh, felt that social media has helped put the voice back to underrepresented groups. Um, it's really allowed like-minded groups to band and, and build followings to make uh, impact on society. So I'll be talking a little bit about those and, and sort of the most impactful ones uh, in the last few years. And what's really interesting too is that, uh, that what we're seeing is that people around the world are hearing each other. And, um, you know, before it was so localized just because, you know, there wasn't sort of this ability to mass communicate. And now everybody's so globally connected that uh, people are allowed to join movements from all over the world and even bring them to their uh, countries, cities um, and towns. So it's really interesting how people are joining these movements to make a difference within their own uh, societies. Um, I was just going to, you know, talk about really uh, in social media and what it's done, right? Sort of these movements and these hashtags that we sort of see throughout time um, that have really sort of revolutionized. And and um, and I was just doing quite a lot of research and, and sort of found like the top you know, five or six movements that we've seen really take... Um, take flight in the last few years. So, um, you know, over these years, these social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, have allowed us to um, witness really huge waves of activism and, um, and have really sort of changed the way that, um, that we even behave, right? Because uh, ultimately we know that anything can be shown and everybody or anyone that's following these things can see them. So it really starts the conversation. So the first and one of the most important hashtags and movements that really occurred in social media um, was for the first time actually started in 2006, which was a movement to empower, um, it was empowerment through empathy really. And um, although this movement went viral in 2017, it actually started in 2006 and it's the Me Too movement, hashtag Me Too. Um, and basically, you know, a high profile actor took it on Twitter and really encouraged women to share their narrative about sexual harassment and assault. And in 2017, it really spread like wildfire. So what really, what that did obviously was um, brought down quite a few, uh, uh, quite a few people, um, you know, that were, were feeling that they didn't have a voice in, um, in, sexual assault and started really bringing out uh, and people behind them really sort of saying, you know what, I also experienced something else. Um, with more than 12 million posts in just one day, hashtag me too really became the biggest movement on social media in 2017. It then actually spread to various countries um, like France and Spain and Italy. And, um, and, you know, we were hearing stories uh, from all over the world. So um, it, you know, this movement in particular significantly unwrapped sort of the stigma attached to um, publicly speaking about uh, sexual assault and um, hopefully really aims to end the culture of violence um, around uh, uh, that space. So, um, you know, that was one of the most important movements within social media. And I think that it would have been really hard to, without having um, 
sort of these communities uh, represent and, and have a voice would have been hard to, to really um, bring to the masses. Um, the other one that was actually very interesting um, was uh, kind of on a lighter note was, I don't know if you guys remember the ice bucket challenge, right? So um, hashtag ice bucket challenge was really a popular uh, hashtag associated with the ALS um, movement. Well, you know, not movement, but just awareness. And what was really interesting about that was that um, it really began to spread awareness and raise donation money for ALS. So um, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, What's interesting about that was that it was really a um, feel good movement in which people felt like they were really making a difference by doing this, which was really fun. Uh, but at the same time, bringing money to the organization and uh, uh, building awareness. So the hashtag actually went viral in 2014 and since then has been taken up by millions. Um, doing this really fun challenge. Uh, so that was sort of a more lighthearted way in which people were bringing awareness to something like a disease. Um, most recently, uh, although again, it started in about 2012, uh, Black Lives Matter, right, has been a huge uh, movement and is. So this one actually originated on Facebook um, through really just, it was a really heartfelt post after the shooting of 17-year-old uh, Trayvon Martin in 2012. And the hashtag led to a civil rights movement um, in the US really, and has been, the hashtag so far has been used over 30 million times on Twitter alone. So, which is an average of 17,000 uh, hashtag uses a day just on Twitter, which is amazing, right? How, um, how that's really moved uh, people to take action one way or the other and really brought awareness to what's going on and really sparked a lot of discussion um, in today's society to, to, to really bring change about. Um, and then also one of the, one of the most uh, popular ones is called uh, He for She. So um, really the 21st century has been a trendsetter when it comes to you know, gender equality. So um, this is actually a movement in which um, what they're trying to do is really sort of shake the century old roots of uh, patriarchy. And so it really, um, it's been backed by famous people like Emma Watson and Justin Trudeau, and it really seeks to involve boys and men in the movement of equality for women. Um, so actually the hashtag really got a lot of support, not only in the US, but also in other countries like Mexico and Rwanda, UK, um, and and uh, really has you know, built awareness around what we can do uh, to help um, you know, bring hopefully just equality uh, for women. So these are just a few examples of how uh, social media through movements have really created an incredible uh, platform for people to express their feelings. Um, you know, no judgment on, you know, what what one feels or doesn't feel, but it's they're allowed to say it and really, um, again, like I said at the beginning, sort of bring the underrepresented uh, groups up and and have a voice and really uh, affect change. So, um, so it's just been very interesting to see see that from the beginning to end, and really, this is just going to get. Uh, I think stronger and better and also I think as a society will allow us to move in a in a healthier direction on how to better communicate and behaviors right around uh, around what we do and how we do things. So that's that's what I have. Thank you Mary Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. I know I'm going to have to go um, in a, in a little bit, but I had a, a quick question. Um, 17,000 hashtags a day, that's a lot of content. And 
Um, just wanted to know, do you think that this, during this shutdown with the pandemic, do you think that this has had more, um, what would you say, activation, uh, more reaction just because of this? Or do you think it's it would have happened anyway, all of this, you know, uh, you know, I think the Black Lives Matter movement contributed to people getting out on the streets and doing more pronounced activity. Um, do you think the pandemic had anything to do with that? I definitely think and and have seen, right, that there's a lot more movement on social media since the pandemic, right? So, um, you know, people were, were stuck at home. We didn't have much to do. Uh, you know, some people... It, just, it, it was really a moment in which like definitely where there had been a little bit of a of a movement before the pandemic to sort of stay away from social media. This was a way to socialize again with our friends. And so we were seeing streams of information and really being fed uh, things that maybe we weren't looking at before. Um, do I think that it uh, that it's moved more people? Maybe I do think uh, that that is true just because there's been more people on it and more active, you know, we've, we've been more active on social media in the last four months. Um, do I think that it wouldn't have been sort of as um, strong or activated because, you know, I'm not sure. I do think though that there has been, you know, a correlation between staying home and being more on, on social media platforms um, than, than before, you know, in, in, in progressing the movement for sure. Right. And, you know, these recent talks, um, and I'll segue to Eugene in just a second, but these recent talks about censoring, censoring, um, Twitter and censoring, you know, censoring, um, certain social platforms. Do you think that will ever happen. Like Jean was talking about the U.S. shutting down radio stations where people were doing things that were considered illegal. Would that happen he here? What What do you think? Look, you know, it's funny because I was just talking to a friend recently and I will never say never because, you know, things have happened that uh, have surprised us, um, right, over time. I don't think it can happen. I think that maybe a platform can, I think a platform can uh, decide what they want on their platform or not in terms of content. I think that can happen, right? And, and has happened. Do I think that a platform can be banned and and you know like what we're talking about like TikTok for example what's happening currently with TikTok I think that it would be a major um misstep if if that's done just because of of you know um freedom of speech right it's like it, I don't know it's a, it's a platform where these kids are and everyone is like talking and and uh, there's no reason for it to no longer exist I I I have a hard time thinking that that's going to happen, but I don't know. Yeah, you wonder about the dark web they talk about, which I don't even know what that means, but people talk about that. And you think, well, if the government can't control something that they perceive as um, undermining our government or something, how can they regulate something like TikTok used mostly by kids who are putting on little shows or you know doing their music or whatever? Uh, just wondering. Yeah, I mean, I think that actually one of the things that came out of TikTok was uh, that was actually, um, and I might be wrong, but I think it did come out of TikTok, which was in in um, Donald Trump's convention uh, when this girl put up a TikTok saying like, "Oh, I bought a ticket. Oops, but won't be going," and that just spiraled into. A million little kids, you know, buying tickets, and then obviously they, they, you know, or nobody showed up. Um, so it, 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 you know, it's not just a platform of, you know, it was right, a little dance platform, whatever. I think, you know, the kids, Gen Z, 
they're really getting involved in what has to do, you know, activism is really strong right now with what's happening with Black Lives Matter, with the police, you know, everything, police brutality. I mean, there's a lot of movement within the Gen Zers and they know how to use social media very well. And they'll follow each other over anyone else. Like, you know, news broadcasts, like, you know, I have two teenagers. I don't think they've seen like, ABC News ever, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like they see what they see and what their friends talk about, right? And and that's what that is. And then they'll Google it if they want a little bit more information on it. But the reality is that this is it. I think it will be a massive misstep if something like that happens. But you know, again, I, I don't think that we can. We don't know. Yeah. People find a way, just like Jean was pointing out, that if there's a message to be had, and interestingly, um, I've heard people say it all points to money, but I think things have changed a little bit with Generation Z, as you said. They're very concerned about the um, environment and about rights and wrongs. Kids know, uh, you know, rights and wrongs. So Magali, thank you again for your time and uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. And we really appreciate your um, your participation in the conference on Texas 2020. Thank you so much, Jean. I loved your, it was like the most entertaining uh, piece. I'm going to go back and listen to it again. Thank you so yes, much. <laughs> thank you. Bye. So take care. Um, Jean, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, K, uh, X, E, R, A, and those stations, do they still exist? No, not, not in the form that they were, that they did exist. Uh, in 1986, when, we, when my collaborator and I, Bill Crawford, first got started researching this subject, uh, the first time we went to Del Rio, we were, we were listening to the station X, E, R, F from Ciudad Acuna on the way down there. But then on subsequent trips, we started noticing that it was lower powered station and only in Spanish. And during the course of our early research, the Mexican government seized XCRF uh, from the from the uh, Del Rio owners and, and made it a lower power station and, and just had Spanish language programming only on it. But the, the gentleman that was pictured in the in the photo I showed with Wolfman Jack, uh, his name is Arturo Gonzalez. And he owned that station, XERF, uh, there in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, well, 70s and 80s, rather, and 60s as well. But uh, but he would call me like twice a year up until the time he di died at the age of 104 uh, <laughs> up into this century and say, Gene, I'm getting the station back. We're going to play rock and roll. We're going to boost up the power and play rock and roll and advertise cigarettes on it. Uh, so he still had this desire to get the station back and even though when he when he first gave it up he said it had been nothing but a headache to him because it was an, an a continuous process of dealing with the Mexican government to keep various factions happy so that he could retain his radio station license in Mexico uh, but I, I just always thought that was great that he kept the fire alive to want to get the station back and start it up again in one of our other panels, we're going to talk about the Gory Girls uh, from Huntsville. They're oh, yeah. Okay. And they, they, uh, one woman who played in one of those bands received a gift from a woman, uh, somebody in Japan, because they could hear WBAP from Fort Worth all the way there. Now, uh -huh. how far could people hear uh, XERA or um, uh, XELO, some of those? Well, it, it depended on the atmospheric conditions uh, at the time as, as to how how far away they could be heard. But they, they went really all over the world at times. Uh, the country western musician Hank Thompson told me that when he was in the Navy in World War II, uh, he would be in a submarine in the Pacific Ocean submerged and he would tune in one of the border stations to introduce some of his Navy mates to uh, country and western music they had never heard it before uh, and then also we heard stories that a KGB agent in Moscow would tune in XERF and listen to Wolfman Jack to try to learn English 
So I, I always like that story because they probably had a very unusual style of speaking English. If, if in fact, they did that. and learn how to howl like a wolf. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you know those. Uh, my understanding is that you could navigate by those radio signals. So it, that would have been interesting. And they could keep you awake too. The uh, San Antonio musician uh, Salas Gonzalez told me that when they were touring in the '60s, up you know in the Midwest and Oregon and places like that. He would tune in those stations in the middle of the night and listen to the crazy preachers in order to keep himself awake while he drove. Oh. So it it served the public in that way as well. Right, right. And and I, I think, you know, our local musicians used a number of those uh, to get their music out. So uh, oh, absolutely. There, I think there was a radio station even in the Gunner Hotel here in San Antonio. Um, but Gina, really thank you. You've really enlightened us and shown us the beginning of what was the first mass media um, with the advent of radio and how quickly they became renegade. So we really thank you. And uh, you've done a lot of yeoman's work and great research and it's very entertaining. Well, and thank we thank you. you for being part of the conference on Texas. Oh, I was delighted to be here. Thank you.